first couple of quarters that I work with you, it's a little bit like a blind date. I'm gonna get to know you more and more because I have to kind of put your head in my head and vice versa. And so we have a really collaboration-based relationship, but that means that you have to trust me that- If you are wanting to be a writer, doesn't matter what the title is coming before writer, if you aren't writing, you're not a writer. I just hit the scene and we had our little Y2K level panic where everybody, oh my God, it's insane. Um, and sure, like it, it can be threatening, but I would argue that if it's threatening that you've already made yourself redundant and it's simply your chickens coming home to roost. Um... Hey everybody, welcome back to the Challenge Tunity podcast. I'm Chris Lawson, your host. We have a very interesting and probably yeah, in some of your opinion a longer episode today we're going to be talking to a number of content writers that work within the agency world and get their take on a plethora of things however before we get into it i'd like to introduce you to jordan wolf my co-host who intentionally waits until the last minute because then he'll be older and therefore much wiser jordan how are you doing I'm here. I am definitely here. Present. Well, it's August. We've made it thus far. I think we're, mm -hmm. what, what is this, episode 15 or something like that? I mean, we're, we're flying. I don't know. I can only count to 10. So it's, uh, it's, it's all new territory for me. <laughs> That's including the thumbs, right? Yeah. 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 Well, like I mentioned, we've got uh, two content writers who are... Uh, I would say extremely experienced in the world of search marketing content, which is, I think, some of the most complicated content to write because it's not just, hey, I'm going to create some social f post that's all fluff. It's like, it, no, it's tied to deliverables. You're trying to move the needle with Google while, you know, at the same time, educate and speak the language of that audience uh, or of the business to an audience that, you know, is looking for something specific. So um, mm. I'm excited. I'm excited. Yeah, it's also... It's also a very abstract topic for a lot of people, even clients mm -hmm. that are, you know, signed up for that kind of work there. You know, it's, it's not something you really understand until, until you start to see those outcomes. And, you know, they're not really easily connecting the job or the, the content itself with the outcomes of like, oh, I sold more for my product or I, you know, was right. able to get into that market that I wasn't in before. So it's, uh, it's an interesting thing, sometimes a little thankless, sometimes a little hidden. So, I, you know, we're, we're, it, it's going to feel like an episode where we're talking about something that never gets talked about, like deep sea fish or something like that. But uh, it's just content writing, but not, not something that gets a lot of sunlight sometimes. Personally, I'm kind of excited to have the two of them because um, I'll let the audience figure out who's who. But one of the writers is extremely gifted um, at narrative writing, while the other one is, you know, extremely gifted with, with technical and so technical writing requires a different approach uh, than narrative writing. You know, both can be, you know, to a certain degree good at storytelling or, you know, grammar and, you know, you know, getting what they need out of the client. But at the end of the day, the discipline of writing technical versus narrative writing is very different. So I am totally stoked to see how they're going to actually, you know, answer different questions or, or what kind of topics come out of this um, from, from their own lens because they're not going to have the same answers. That's for sure. Yeah. And also adapting to the the changing world we all live in with things like AI and all that, that mm -hmm. uh, impact on how content is being developed by people in a variety of different scales and what, what impact, if any, that's going to have. That's right. Well, why don't, why don't we, why don't we cut to it? Um, let's do it because I, I can't wait. Let's just go. Let's go. Let's go. Welcome back. As we mentioned earlier, we have a couple guests with us today. We're going to be covering all sorts of things around the subject of content writing professionally and such, as well as in the agency world. So we, I'll introduce both of our guests. Uh, we've got Megan Bamford, who's senior content writer, uh, wordsmith and subject matter expert wrangler, who's joining us today. And we'll learn all sorts of stories that lead into both of those uh, introductories. And then we have uh, Madison Sterling content writer on our team at Atrium, uh, LinkedIn celeb, and uh, poet of landing pages. <laughs> so it's going to be kind of fun to see where all these interests and very passionate creative people uh, collide with the boring and sometimes uh, structurally challenging world of marketing. I'm pumped. So thanks for, thanks for joining us today. 
cool. Yeah, awesome to be here. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> Best transition ever, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Matt, well, Madison's that's like what I, I'm usually be, is the awkward Matt, moments. Yeah, Madison's like I normally write the content. I'm behind the camera. I'm not. I'm not I've been but, on camera yeah. once before. All right, I do have a YouTube video where I talk about snappy hookers. If you ever want to see it, that's literally the brand name. It's on it right there. now. It's out there now. Yeah. yeah. Is this All one of pot- just like funneled through to yeah. search? And now- <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> I figure because obviously the, the through line here is, uh, you know, both have experience working at, at our agency at Atrium. Uh, while this podcast is not about Atrium, the, the life of being a writer within an agency environment is something that maybe some may strive for, but that's a small group of people. That's a, in, a, in a way, it's a very elite group of agency writers and what that actually means, all the trials and tribulations, the good, the bad, the ups, the downs. And uh, for a lot of uh, what I've seen from my side as, as um, you know, somebody who's been working and helping those that are in this, uh, this line of work bring their creative side into line with say the marketing side i think there's a lot of conflict and strife that comes along with being a creative individual in what can sometimes be both creative and um you know very structured environment so i think we'll maybe start with the the agency side of things as and that'll get to get to know you two a little bit better in the process it sounds Um, so shakespearean jordan well thou art and such we are talking (laughs) about writing so we better rise to the occasion Mm-hmm. I'm there not doing this in soliloquies. I'll be very honest. Nobody wants that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that the obvious one, and I, I know the answer to this, but this is definitely for the audience's benefit. But in in um, maybe I'll, I'll start with Megan. Um, you know, why did you get into the marketing world as as a writer versus say any other part of the marketing world, or was it even that way? Uh, completely by accident, as I think is kind of the funny origin story of a lot of people in marketing. Um, I actually have a poli science sociology background, uh, but I've always loved writing. It's kind of my little creative side coming out. But most of all, I am a people person, uh, despite being an introvert. So go figure. Tell me how that works later on. But I want to <laughs> tell stories. I want to figure out what drives people, what makes them unique. And then, you know, obviously, by extension, their businesses, we all interact with this weird little world that we inhabit. And have to kind of figure it out. And for me, my junior journey into writing actually started with writing uh, color commentary for my friend who builds uh, lightsabers, fantastic products, and went through the Comic-Con circuit and decided that I actually really liked writing professionally. Was it an opportunity time in, in my life where I wanted to figure out where I actually wanted a career to go rather than just kind of doing odd jobs and, and kind of freelancing and uh, fell into it, fell in love. And here I am like, almost seven years later, which is wild, uh, wild to say. And that's, that's seven years in agency life. Had some, some background before that as well, but it's been, it's been a ride. It started with lightsabers. Well, <laughs> yeah. Lightsabers what? and top gun. Go figure. Hey. Wow. Wow. I mean, who has that story? I mean, let's be honest. Well, I remember I was looking up, um, uh, when we first got to know you, that, that company and, um, I forgot the name, but, uh, Genesis really amazing Custom products. Savers. Yeah, yeah, really amazing. I'll give product. him a plug. Maybe my inner, my inner Star Wars nerd was very much like I probably want one of those. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, uh, I know we've we've got uh, Megan's side of the story here, but uh, everybody who gets into this line of work has a little bit of a different background. Um, Madison, how how did you uh, approach that? Yeah. So a lot like Megan, marketing was not my original end goal. I originally. When I entered into university and did my English literature and religious studies degree, I didn't really particularly have an end career goal in mind as to the Mm -hmm. field I wanted to join. I just knew that I really liked writing and I really liked continuing to learn and especially learning about the world around me and how it works and the ways in which different um, aspects of the world make things go around. So hence the reason for doing the religious side of things. Um, Honestly, I entered into marketing kind of by happenstance. chance. Right before my graduation from my bachelor's degree, I started to to apply to as many jobs as I could that had anything to do with writing simply because I knew I wanted to continue doing it. I got really lucky and got picked up by a large distribution company here in Edmonton and worked there for three years doing YouTube script writing, Mm -hmm. blogs, and a whole bunch of other marketing unicorn stuff. Um, it was a lot. It definitely burnt me out, especially as this was during the pandemic. And 
once I started to realize that my stay there was not as long term as maybe I had originally thought it would be, I moved on and found Atrium, really. And you've never looked back. Basically. <laughs> you, know, you know, what's crazy What's crazy to me is that, you know, you talk to so many people who work in the agency world specifically um, over the years, and you realize that everyone's story is different. Nobody gets to the same place. You know, like, you know, oh yeah, I remember seeing you on that path as I got here. And that never happens because people can get here in, in a thousand different ways. And personally, I think from the writing side of the agency world, I think that's what makes writers so unique. You know, um, the lens that you view things, the, the, the experience you have writing X number of pieces of content across so many different genres and um, industries and with different tones and language, like it, it makes you this Swiss army knife. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's empowering. And, and it's, it's, mind-blowing to me how you guys do it and, and and the fact that you guys all got there in different ways makes no sense to me i don't know how you guys do it it's definitely a unique skill uh, skill set that not everybody has um and i think a lot of that like not every writer will be able to do what we do in terms of content writing simply because there's too much bouncing back and forth between subject to subject to client to client to industry to industry I think in a weird way, you have to have some chaotic energy to yourself in order to keep up. Otherwise, like you're just, you're going to lose your mind trying to keep all the information straight. And so if you're somebody who likes to go from subject to subject or topic to topic, you're probably going to do a lot better in an agency simply because you get the opportunity to do so much more. Variety. I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent because this kind of reminds me of, um, I was talking with actually someone on the social team uh, the other day. And that conversation led me to talk about how when they're writing and they're writing short, short, short form, but in a way they're doing the same challenge that they're trying to put on the hat of a different person in a different industry in a different place Mm -hmm. who's talking to a different audience all the time. And that kind of back and forth, the only thing I could really compare it to is, is kind of much more like being an actor. I would, I would assume Mm -hmm. where you're trying to put on the skin and your skill is really in your ability to do so. It's the ability to imagine being someone else and putting yourself through that skill set to create a thing. In that case, it's a stage play, but in your case, it could be a piece of content, a landing page, a website content, whatever it happens to be that, that might represent that, that person, that audience, that goal. Hmm. And you know, it's funny, we've, we've been onboarding lately, right? So we have some lovely new faces who might look forward to seeing on the podcast, I'm sure at some point. But what I'll tell them is like, look, if you're coming in viewing this solely as a writing job, right, you're going to sit down, you're going to do a whole bunch of long form content, you're going to burn out and be very disappointed very quickly. Because what I actually love most about my job is that yes, I do a lot of writing, I get to play with the words and make them sound good. But I'm also an improv actor. Um, I, I get to go through and, and wear many different hats in many different industries, depending on the day. Sometimes it's one client, sometimes it's three or four clients, and I'm bouncing from, you know, weddings to cybersecurity to injury law, whatever the case may be. And you just have to have that thirst for knowledge. And it's, you know, I was saying mm. to one of our new girls the other week, I was like, it's the first rule of improv. Just say yes. Dig in figure out what's authentic to you, figure out what's authentic to the client and then their audience. And from that craft a story that they connect with and put it out there. And then, you know, there's a little uh, extra flair of, of writing for the robots and the the Google overlords and making sure that they turn up and get that brand authority with it uh, at the end of the day. Well, and I think that's a really good segue, you know, to talking a bit about, you know, your experiences and working with clients in a variety of industries and, you know, Megan, given that you were just talking a little bit about that, I'll throw mm-hmm. it over to you. How how do you as a writer write for, you know, I don't know, some oil and gas, very technical, you know, piece and then flip into mountain, beautiful view, you know, excursions to, you know, like Caribbean real estate to like how how do you do that? Have you told the like access mat rite of passage story? On the, on the podcast yet if you want to work so. for atrium so. yeah if you want to work for atrium <laughs> guess what you're gonna write about some access mats because it turns out we're like a world leader in that industry it's how i won one of my first awards um not that i'm trying to toot my own horn it's just really really funny to me uh now again whenever we ever we have someone new start it's not that we do it intentionally to haze or anything by that stretch but it's just 
so welcome to an industry that we see, we happen to have a really strong foothold in. Um, and I know for me, I, the first client I ever worked on is a tourism company based out of Banff. I spent a lot of time in the mountains. That's really easy. It's I love going hiking and exploring and being out in the uh, great outdoors. So of course your brain kind of naturally clicks into that and you go, yeah, this makes sense. And so getting the information from clients is easy because you're naturally following your, your intuitive train of thought. Now, I'm not a valve person. I don't like math. I don't like, like, I, I'm not going to be personally rewarded building an engine or anything like that, but I have learned over the course of several years how to connect with my technical clients or my heavy industrial clients and go, okay, you may do the same thing in theory as 50 other companies in, in the same jurisdiction for that matter. But there's a reason why people come to you, whether it's your customer service, whether it's the fact that you use a certain kind of, you know, metal compound that actually makes your stainless steel perform better than anybody else. Those are really the selling points. And you know why you're special. You're just not used to telling someone who's not in your world. And so it's kind of a give and take. And I, I always say to new clients now, it's kind of a catchphrase I've learned over the years is saying, the first couple of quarters that I work with you, it's a little bit like a blind date. I'm going to get to know you more and more because I have to kind of put your head in my head and vice versa. And so we have a really collaboration based relationship. But that means that you have to trust me that when I'm asking questions that might sound silly or redundant, and maybe they are, but it's me learning what matters to you, what matters to the people that we're trying to reach. It helps me inform my research. So I'm not going down some weird rabbit hole and going, oh, none of that was relevant. Perfect. That's nine hours of research just down the hole. Um, it's, it, yeah, it's just, it's a really fun process of, of learning what matters most and then learning how to translate it into language that is digestible for whatever the specific audience may be. Hmm. How about you, Madison? Yeah. I need you to reiterate the question so I can. Like how, how does, how does a thing. writer, how does a writer, I mean, how do you, how do you mm -hmm. jump from one industry to another or from one style or tone to the next all in the same day, the yeah. same week, you know, like how does a writer do that? So for myself, there's a couple strategies with that because I'm much more of a technical writer. I do things much more technically. So I'm not mm -hmm. jumping from day to day from one client to the next. I'm batching my work in such a way that for one entire week, I'm focusing on one client and I'm doing my best to completely drive home everything I've learned about them all the little nuances, nailing their tone and the way that they like to talk about themselves and their own product. And then the next week I change brains and I do something different. A lot of that comes down to is understanding your own ebbs and flows within your own content mm. production. So like I know for myself coming in on like a Monday morning with a really technical client, I probably need to sit for like an hour or so and just refresh through my notes, maybe check out some of my old blogs again, get back into that headspace and that tonality. And then by Friday when I'm done and I've wrapped up and I'm doing my finishing touches on that pieces, uh, on those pieces of content, I'm letting myself slowly come out of that mode and start transitioning into my next client. Um, so it's much more process based on my end. It's you start here, ease yeah. into it. Stop here, mm. ease out of it. How important is coffee in your process? I am not a coffee drinker. I no? reduced how much I drink. Yeah, oh. I might have a cup a day at most. Wow. Sometimes I go without. Yeah. I I don't I don't align with that. I drink far too much. <laughs> <laughs> I respect it. I wish I was more up and up that angle, but uh, like Chris and I went for coffee right before this, and I apologized if I talked too much because I had iced coffee, and I am a small individual, so. Just yeah. pump it through your brain veins right now. It's good. Megan got a small so and it was like this big in her hands. Yeah, <laughs> I am I am so pumped to be here, but that also might just be the tachycardia. I don't know. <laughs> well, I'm I'm actually gonna save your answer, uh, Megan, a little bit because you've you've been in at least our agency longer than the Madison. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is fresher in your mind, Madison, but like uh, I know you've been writing now professionally for a little while, but like the the jump from an agent from a, a business to an agency must have come with its own kind of intriguing twists. Was there anything that kind of was unique to the agency kind of workflow or or world that uh, you didn't really expect? So, at my previous job, I was on a marketing team of six that quickly went down to three, and then quickly went back up to six. Um, so I did everything from dealing with re rebates and co-op dollars to traditional print media advertising to YouTube scripts 
to dealing with discontinued products and everything in between. It was a lot um, and a never ending tunnel of basically stress and tasks that never seemed to get done because there was just not enough time in the day. Transitioning from that to one job where it's like, all you have to do is write. You don't have to do anything else. You don't even have to open a spreadsheet if you don't want to. It's streams lines so much and allows me to really focus on what I'm doing as much as we are bouncing back and forth between lots of clients, industries, topics, subjects, whatever. I'm writing at the end of the day. I'm not doing Mm. math to calculate co-op dollars so I can get rebate ads and stuff like that. I'm strictly focusing on one task. So for me, at least, agency life has been a breeze because it means I'm not doing as much as I was before and I can literally focus on the one thing I'm good at. Now, Chris and I may obviously agree with this because that's a very atrium-y type thing of not having generalists but having specialists instead. But that's not Mm -hmm. always the case with agencies. Some agencies do have just a pool of generalists as well. And you kind of get what's in front of you and that's what you do that day. Um, But uh, yeah, you know, we agree that, uh, you know, having the ability to hone your skill and sharpen it and be the best at A, B or C is a really and valuable not, thing, hopefully. And being able to focus on that one skill in particular. My writing over the past year and a bit of being at Atrium has grown and improved in ways that three years at my previous job didn't touch simply because I wasn't writing as much. And because I was having to learn so many other skills along the way, I had to deprioritize that main one that I actually wanted to build. And so, mm. again, it's just a matter of like, I had time to focus on this thing and get better at it rather than split myself into six other people and try to mm-hmm. do seven tasks in eight hours. Mm. Now, now, Megan, you've spent more time in the trenches. Is there uh, some sage wisdom you can kind of have that 10,000 foot view and go, yeah, th- but here's the story I've picked up over time about uh, the agency world. Yeah, like, you know, I've been, I've been thinking because technically Atrium is my first agency. Um, I did a lot of freelancing prior to this and kind of ran my own little company and partnering with local businesses, which was a lot of fun. So like Madison, I was used to wearing all of the hats um, and, and then some, and that's quite exhausting as I'm sure anybody in the, in the industry will tell you. Uh, I love the specialization focus of, of Atrium, but I remember what kind of threw me the most when I first started is just learning the diversity of the role, right? Because, you know, like I said before, you see writer, you think that you're just in the back typing. But what I really loved and has kind of grown into a continued and, and long sustained passion for me at this point is that collaboration based element with the client. So you're like three parts investigative journalist, one part um, but client therapist at times because you got to have to understand their world and the, the struggles and tribulation that they're going through as well. Um, but then how do you consolidate that? How do you implement that not into just a writing schedule, but a balancing all of your tasks, understanding how that works in the holistic ecosystem of, a, as a, of an agency as a whole. And then mm-hmm. how do you communicate with other team members and, and build a team as I've been lucky enough to do with you guys, um, where new people coming in have that on-ramp to learn and adjust to agency life or deprogram from other agencies that, as, as you've said, do things very, very differently. So it's, it's, it's kind of, if I were to sum it up in a sentence, it is an ever evolving beast, far more than people I think expect in the digital marketing world. We know that digital marketing is always changing, but agencies, if you if you want to thrive, you just don't stop and you have to really have that tenacity to keep growing and adapting with it. I think you're absolutely right. It is an evolving beast, you know, in, in the wise words of Megan Bamford. Um, it just is a digital that. digital digital marketing is just that it evolves faster than probably any industry that i'm aware of um, marketing degrees do not have a shelf life as long as they once did much like or in comparison to other industries those degrees are lasting a lot longer they're more relevant so let's maybe talk a little bit less about the role and the you know the world we live in as far as you know agency life is concerned talk a bit about content writing and the the practice of what would the two of you guys say has been the the biggest change for you, you know, say in the last 12 months, you know, given that we're kind of like entering into the fall of 2023, the last 12 months has seen a lot of change with, I'll just leave it there. Like what, what would you say <laughs> is the biggest, the biggest change from your, from your own lens? I imagine I'd actually love to hear your thoughts first, because you've been with us okay. for coming up on a year and a half. So go for it. Yeah. So I would say definitely it's the nature and ways that content production is changing now that AI is entered into the field. The elephant in the room? 
Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so like, as we mentioned at the front, I do a lot of posts on LinkedIn. And the moment that ChatGPT really hit the public sphere there, suddenly everybody's posts were AI written. And you could tell. You can absolutely tell because of the way it's formatted, it's worded, the tonality, the grammatical mistakes, the other problems with it and stuff. In summary. Um, yeah. AI is an interesting like tool. And that's, I think the key word there is tool. Yeah. It's not a device to replace content writers. It's a tool in the toolbox, but people now, especially with it being so new are like monkeys with sticks. We're figuring out how to work yeah. with them and use it. And there's going to be a lot of mistakes at first and a lot of strange things that happen because of it. Obviously Google search is probably going to change to compensate with that as we've seen some mm -hmm. hints of that within um, the industry, but Honestly, I think that is the biggest one that's over at least my tenure here is seeing all of a sudden this new potentially threatening technology come into play. I think it's threatening not because it's going to take jobs like everybody was saying it was mm -hmm. going to happen. I think it's threatening because it's very easy for anybody in any industry to get a new sexy thing and it become that crutch, right? Yes. I, I fear... Yeah. I fear for young writers who come into our industry right now because they have to use these tools to be efficient now. They have to use these tools to, to be able to bang out X number of pieces or whatever. The question is, how do you use it? And if you use it incorrectly, your skills are going to become dull, right? But you have to sharpen yeah. those skills. At the end of the day, if you are wanting to be a writer, doesn't matter what the title is coming before writer, if you aren't writing, you're not a writer. And Ooh. that's all it is, you know? You have to write <laughs> Funny to be a writer. Take. Like, yeah. but it's true though. Like if I yeah. outsource all my writing to AI, I'm not a writer, I'm an AI prompter, you know? I haven't Ooh. done anything. I like this episode. Yeah. Hot takes of Madison <laughs> Sterling. <laughs> Moving forward, we're going to have a segment at the end of every episode where Madison just tears someone apart. <laughs> just ranting. Trust me, this has been loaded up for a while. My, if I'm able to, my partner is a tattoo artist. And of course, yep. AI, especially generative AI with images, is becoming an anxiety within that industry in a lot of mm. ways. There's already issues with the uses of usage of digital tools and art creating. For instance, there's been a long standing debate between whether or not graphic art should be held at the same standard as like actual like physical art. And that's a much too complicated question to get into. And it's quite a philosophical debate. But now with the injection of AI, that blows a whole lot of things out of proportion yeah. can you be an artist if you're not actually doing anything besides prompting some people are saying yes i would say probably not but there are again it's a tool megan what would your hot take be in the world of a you know ai in the world of you know being a content writer that's a good question i mean i was gonna say naturally the the obvious elephant in the room as we said is is ai has hit the scene and we had our little y2k level panic where everybody oh my god it's insane um and sure like it, it can be threatening but i would argue that if it's threatening that you've already made yourself redundant and it's simply your chickens coming home to roost Ooh. um you don't yeah you don't pay a writer to put out junk you can um a lot of people do it's an unfortunate strategy that we're going to see more and more and then overnight, we're going to see Google or whoever the ranking search engine is at the time come in and they they know that it's costing them money as people are just putting out quantity. And eventually, that's there's going to be an algorithm that get, gets wise to it. Everything that is done and is not actually authority-based, is not thought leadership, doesn't actually have a soul behind it, is just going to tank overnight. And there's going to be a lot of businesses, very unfortunately, that will have put their trust in a writing team that just lose everything overnight. And I, my heart goes out to that because that's going to be a very, very dark day in this industry. Well, what you're really we, talking about there is is marketing results yeah. matter, right? Yes. And I, I think as a writer, a writer, get if it's mm -hmm. digital or not, you're crafting unique content in whatever form for yes. whatever that purpose is. If you're writing a novel, if you're creating a white paper, if you're whatever... You, you have an outcome that you're trying to accomplish. A lot of the time in digital marketing, the content you're producing 
uh, you know, text-based content specifically is there to get engagement, there to educate, whether that education is for the end user or for search engines like Google, so on and so forth. You have to be a writer back to what Madison is saying. You, you cannot yes. lean on AI written content that's pulling from already digested content on the internet and assume to get those results, at least for today. That's where we are today. And so yeah. Um, I, I value both of those opinions that you guys are sharing because I think there's a lot, like a lot of our audience fit in one of two categories. You're either a business leader of which you're not going to be a hundred percent in the know on these topics. You just, you're not, it's evolving so quickly, or you're a marketing um, expert of some sort, a CMO, uh, you're, a, you're facilitating or a specialist of some sort. And so you might be in the know, but you also might be feeling very threatened by AI, even as a graphic designer, you know? So I think those, those points that you guys make is very valid. Hone in on your craft, you know, lean in on these two uh, into these softwares or, or AI tools as for what they can be used for and don't allow them to, to replace the skills you've developed for so many years. Well, I'd say, put it this way. And I think Madison, you would agree with this. Not that I'm trying to tee up to agree with me, but think about it this way. If you had AI write a movie script versus a really unique and actually independent film that is leaps and bounds better, which one do you want to see win the Oscar? If your content is of quality, you should have no problem walking into that room, holding up your script, your blog, whatever it is, and say, yeah, I wrote this. You put it next to a machine, you're going to know that I wrote this. And if mm -hmm. you can't do that, that's a serious sign that you need to take a, step, take a step back or your agency needs to, needs to take a step back or whoever you're employing needs to take a step back and go, what am I actually contributing to this sphere? Because if, as long as you're an active, leading, engaging contributor to this sphere, you're fine and you're going to continue to evolve. But if AI can take your place, you need to seriously ask yourself why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, I figured this would and, be... Yeah, go ahead. No. Sorry. Go for it. Okay. Um, and to like to build off of that and stuff... <laughs> Don't laugh, this is going to make me laugh. <laughs> to build off of it and stuff, um, I think a big part of it too, like if you use AI tools like ChatGPT, if, if you feel threatened by it, just use it for a little bit. Just check it out. Give it a couple of test runs, especially on something that you know a lot about. Yep. And see for yourself just how bad it can get. Because is it a helpful tool? Yeah. Absolutely. And you can use it for a lot of great things. Is it great? No. <laughs> like it's passable at best most of the time but even then you still need that human element to go okay no this sentence is awkward or that fact is wildly incorrect because yeah. ChatGPT does not understand the industry you're writing about nor does it have the, the ability to fact check it's just pulling yeah. something so yep. it could be very well out of context well i know this is obviously a big rabbit hole that could be a whole episode into itself but um we did, we did cover a couple things in that, well, let's call it a rant for now, but it was good. It was a very positive rant, and I think it's, it's very topically important. A lot of people have that on the mind at the moment. But um, a lot of what we were talking about in, the, in between the lines there was, you know, sharpening your skills and staying on top of things and, like, continuing to improve mm. regardless of the tools or the trends or things happening around you. Um, are there certain things that you've done or that you like to kind of focus on to make sure that you're always sharpening that blade? Either one of them. Madison, you are, you are super structured. Okay. I'm going to let you take this because I, I exist and you have such order to your life. <laughs> this is the whole purpose of my LinkedIn, basically. <laughs> and the the easy answer is if you want to like become a better writer is, again, you have to write. And you have to write a lot. You can't expect to be good after finishing one blog or one landing page. You have to keep rinsing and repeating and um, digesting your own work and going, okay, where could I have maybe done better? Where was I really, really good? Maybe this was a, like an awesome sentence here, but the next two were a little bit weaker. How can I adjust this? So I think one is just quantity. You just have to do the do, like do the task, do the do, keep doing it. Um, and then refine what you're currently have produced. And the other big one, and I think this is true kind of across what kind of skills you're trying to learn, but you have to see what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be a better writer, go and read good writer's work 
and see how you can adopt maybe parts of their stigil or their uh, vocabulary or their tonage or their sentence structure into your own copy. It doesn't have to be like word for word, like copy paste, but if you like the way somebody has formatted something, give it a test run yourself and see how you can integrate that naturally. That's good. I like yeah. that. How about you, Megan? Yeah. Um, a lot of the same things, like you have to practice if you're not constantly writing and knowing the difference between writing for yourself and writing creatively and, and exploring your passion. Um, because you need, you need to fuel both sides or you will get very burnt out over time, but also consuming with intention. Like Madison said, go out, consume good work, uh, read things that aren't just mental junk food. So, you know, there's nothing wrong. I love Reddit. I love, uh, you know, Twitter and all these social media things, but go, you know, pick up a good magazine like Forbes or The Economist, see what people are talking about in the world, be engaged with what is around you. And then it's much easier to write about it because you see different angles that people in, interact with in real time, because that's essentially what we're talking about. Yes, we may be talking about needle valves, but why do needle valves matter? Well, because in a pharmaceutical environment, blah, 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 blah. So you build that story. Um, but the other big thing is kill your ego. There's, you're going to see an evolution over your writing over time, or at least you, bear, you should if you're, if you're continuing to develop, but don't be scared to be bad. It is so easy, especially if you have that creative heart and that creative brain, as I think most writers do, to be so engaged with what you're doing and to want to have, I like to call it the Pulitzer moment where I'm going to write the best blog on whatever. No, you're not. You work in an agency. You have 60 other blogs that you need to do. It doesn't mean that you half-ass it and you don't put your heart into it, but what does that actually look like in you know, a, a professional environment where you do not have all of the time under the sun? And even if you did, it's actually a bad thing because you're just going to circle. And so learn when to, what's what's good enough and then what excellent good enough is Learn to divorce yourself from what your personal opinion is. Um, learn how to translate and speak to other industries and other languages, as it were, for the, the sake of your client. And just be very humble. Be humble and hungry to consume as much as you can because that's going to come out in your writing and that's really what's going to set you apart, especially not to go back to the AI conversation. But you can read the difference when you know that somebody mm -hmm. actually understands with authority what they're talking about rather than something skimming facts and just putting it out there because, ah, oh, this should work. And that's it'll it'll happen you know every now and then you can't hit a home run with every single blog but your threshold should be you know am i better today than i was six months ago will i be better six months from now than i am today and what am i doing to ensure that on either side of the coin well i know there's one topic that kind of comes up quite frequently you know within the office is is the difference between different types of writers and your kind of default state and madison you even touched on this a little bit um, there are writers that are a little bit more technically natured and other ones that are more narratively natured, those that can kind of blend those two worlds, those that struggle with one side or the other. Um, you know, maybe, maybe I can talk a little bit about writing styles and how that's influenced how you've evolved, um, through your career and as a writer. So, yeah, <clears throat> as I've mentioned before, I'm definitely more of a technical writer for myself. And so technical meaning I deal with a lot of industrial clients a lot of very heavy fact-based stuff um so like oil and gas industries uh safety matting like that kind of stuff for me technical writing comes very naturally it's facts it's information it is why do i want this product because it solves this problem i have so product solution easy peasy it's like a formula basically um very cut and dry a little bit on the boring side but for me, at least, I find that to be um, more interesting because not only do I get to learn about the processes that make the world go round, but I also get to chop it down into pieces so that the average layman could probably understand it. But there's a flip side to that. I'm not the strongest narrative writer. I don't like putting a lot of emotion into hmm. my copy because I'd rather just stick to the obvious facts and the statements of truth and stuff like that. I don't want to appeal to your emotional side because guess what? I don't really care. Um, I'm How do you trying really to feel? get Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get people other businesses tip, typically is what technical writing tends to lean towards. Other businesses, the products and the services they need as quickly as possible. And that means being efficient. Um, so, yeah. Megan. Yeah, and I would say I'm like, I'm on the other side of the spectrum where I can certainly write technical now. That was a long, long uphill battle to kind of wrap my head around the oil and gas industries and all of that. I mean, 
it's it's I actually find it very very fascinating but the way that my brain works to to translate that into something tangible was was it was definitely a learning curve um my approach to anything I do is I'm a storyteller at heart so I want to figure out what makes you tick and that means that I'm going to have a lot generally speaking a lot more of a personal connection with my clients going you know tell me about this or what made you get into this industry or you know if you disappeared tomorrow why do I care things like that and just kind of building a heartfelt story around that that's going to connect with an audience um because that's that's just how I naturally process things as well and so that comes out in my writing but you do have to learn how to kind of cross streams because you're never going to have all of one I mean certain agencies sure they will shoehorn you and can say you are our you know technical whatever writer all you're ever going to write about all day every day is valves fittings whatever equipment and then conversely you have a lot of like the really fancy agencies they're like, yeah, we do weddings and all of that sort of stuff. I actually really like the variety, and I also like that it prevents me from stagnating because as human beings, we always like to take the path of least resistance and go down to what we know and kind of call home. Um, that's death. That's mm. that's death for you as a writer. If you are way too comfortable with what you're writing, that should be a gut check moment. So you just got to lean into it. You got to expect that it's going to be awkward and intimidating. And even on the narrative side, you're going to get clients who are like, oh, you're like, you're narrative, but you're you're real smart. You're a big brain client. All right, I'm going to bring my A game. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to try my best. It's going to be awkward for a couple of months, but we'll get there. And and just having that trust with the client to look at them and say, hey, tell me what I don't know. Tell me what I'm missing. Give me that honest feedback. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I actually don't care, but I need to know because I can't fix what I don't know. And then actually following through on that as well and, and learning and having that improvement being visible in your content because then they just open up and they want to share a lot more and it makes it way easier for the whole process. How about you, Madison? Like, do you have any kind of tips, any, any secrets that you do as far as getting information from clients? Cause I mean, a lot of clients assume you, you're going to just do all this research on your own, right? Even though they're the thought leader, how do you get juice from the orange as Jordan likes to say? So I, again, I always go back to process. I, before going into any kind of content discovery or like interview with a client, I lay out questions that I want to ask. And usually they start with some very general ones to start getting them warmed up and excited to talk about their business. Because at the end of the day, these guys obviously love what they do. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in business. And if you don't like what you're doing, why are you in business? (laughs) Um... So getting them to talk about the things that they're interested in and then slowly easing them into the more technical aspects. I often ask um, very, very specific questions about very specific products or services that a client asks and try to almost surprise them with my ability to sparse out some really niche details because not only does that communicate to them that I have an interest in their industry and potentially their business but it also reassures them that I've done my due diligence on the back end and I've done a little bit of research or I've used my previous industry experience in order to get to this point. I just need you now to bridge the knowledge gap that I am currently breaching. So I conduct interviews with clients um, much more cut and dry and systematically Mm. in that way. How much time do you put in into your prep, you know, to prepare those questions? Like, where do those questions come from? Is it from the data? Is it just based on the topics? Is it the gaps in your own research? Um, I'll start with you, Madison. So a combination of things depends on the situation. Um, For myself, I find it doesn't take very long, of course, as long as I'm familiar with the client. Um, I often will pull from my own previous um, agricultural and and industrial background to help reinforce some of my knowledge on whatever topic. But often what I have that guides me in formatting or formatting those questions is whatever's happened with the previous data and Mm. previous meetings. So points that have been brought up, feedback from previous um, um, the the content, and um, just whatever the keywords are that we're targeting. And then, of course, drilling down more specific and using my own curiosity to follow through. Like, I also want to learn about these businesses because as lame as they are, I'm also really interested in the industrial side of things because it makes sense. Really? And it's Mm -hmm. important. Yeah. Writers writers actually care about what they're writing about? Sometimes, Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> not all the time. I will say that there are definitely some clients that are like, I, you exist and I'll do the job, but I'm not passionate about you. But right. if you can yeah. insert points of intrigue or challenge yourself to 
like fake interest at least you'll start garnering that interest eventually within yourself yeah. and be more curious to learn in a, in a way like i've you know we haven't really talked about the evolution of the future of this this kind of role as a writer but skill set wise to me this has always been the most interesting thing happening at this point in time especially when we talked about ai a moment ago when we've got yes your title is to be a content writer so you think oh I, my job is to put words on on a screen or on a page but really you know it's the quality and focus of those words that's the differentiator and whether you're doing a good job or not um like we talked about actors earlier you know you can stand on a stage and read a script but that is not acting um you know you've got to learn the character you've got to do the the little like innuendos and little anecdotes and things that make a piece of content livable and human instead of just repeating the words and in the environment of ai i think that that's one of those things that really is the most irreplaceable in the current process. You know, the AI can write words on page, but it can't really get that client story or that like that question that keeps coming up that clients, you know, ask them when they're talking about that particular product or the weird use case of this because you found and stumbled into it in your marketplace. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. the, the AI is not going to know that nor have the ability to even find that out. So that that is something leverageable as a content writer to the future as a big big influence. Oh. Yeah. And ultimately what you're talking about is keeping the human element in writing and also keeping the soul of a client in their content. Yes. Like if you're missing out on these little nuances and these little niche parts that make a client unique in your writing, you could be writing about anything, you know, like you have to make it specific. If you're just putting out generic stuff, you're not doing anything that different, let alone really making your client sound worthy of attention on the internet you know like we want that human element that's why we have so many mm -hmm. social media platforms it's why ai writing feels so soulless we need the human still megan, megan yeah. from your perspective yeah yeah I, I was gonna ask you in addition to like your prep time um there's a component when you're dealing with clients where at the very beginning of working with them mm-hmm it's the least you know about them, right? Yes. And as time yeah. goes on, you know more and more and more. But what a lot of people don't think about is the trust factor that a client has a and how that evolves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't we talk a bit, how does that work in amongst your prep time? Like how does all that, you know, tie together? Yeah, no, that's actually a really good point. So my prep time will vary as, as Madison said, it's kind of different from client to client, industry to industry. Um, if it's somebody that you've had, like I've had clients going on, you know, almost seven years now. So I'm able to wrap my head around their industry very easily. I don't have to put a lot of thought into it. It's more of a, a pulse check, to be completely honest, when I go into my interviews with them going, hey, has anything changed? Is there anything that we want to stay away from or anything that we haven't highlighted as of yet? Uh, oftentimes the answer is no. And so it's just kind of like keep the pace and, and hold that line so you get the results that you can count on. But when I'm dealing with clients for the first time, it's it's a great deal of honor, as, as silly as it sounds, to be like, yeah, you're trusting me with your business. And I also understand, like, especially having gone through COVID and, and insane markets that people have had to deal with for the last three years up and down. And, you know, Atrium's had to deal with that ourselves, build, building a business in the middle of a world on fire, just going, I get it. I understand that, you know, you, you want this to work. You want this to be your golden goose, and I will make it that. But you got to trust me because I'm really good at what I do but I'm not an industry leading expert in your field or, hey, I'd be a competitor. So help me learn what I don't know. This is what I do understand from your industry. Correct me if I'm wrong, but just giving them a, that opportunity to not feel, I think, belabored by having to be engaged in our discoveries, but understanding that the more they give, the more I'm able to give back in return and the better and more sustainable long-term their results will be. And I've had clients that have come in typically the first three to six months, sometimes into the like the nine month realm, there's a lot of anxiety. It's the, because mm -hmm. especially if you do search marketing, which is where we predominantly focus at this point, it takes time for results to, to generate. And we always say that your mind, but of course, anybody's going to have a gut reaction of going, I don't know, it's a lot of money. What do we do? And then by six months, they see what we call the hockey stick, where all of a sudden they're getting insane data and they're like, oh, okay, everything you told me was the truth. It's like, yeah, no, I'm not here to lie to you. I am here to basically be your brand champion on behind the screen that nobody knows about but you got to work with me so I can help you because otherwise it is, it's hard. It's hard to write authentic thought leading 
uh, content in any form if it's just, well, I don't know, you figure it out. That's not a good long-term relationship for anybody, but it's mm. definitely not going to help your content live and renew for you so you can continue to generate those leads. You're touching base on a lot of little hidden skills that you kind of develop over time. One that comes to mind that I've witnessed, not just writers, but you could be an ad specialist, a social person, so on and so forth, is that component, I don't know what you would call it, but it's it's tied to your vulnerability, right? Being able to take criticism, being able to like have your work be gutted, you know, how important is it for you as a writer to have thick skin, but also to be able to look in the <laughs> mirror and go, this is how I can be better. Um, and, you know, not, you know, try to drive your car off a bridge at, at the end of the day. Like, how, how do you balance that? Well, let's start with you, Megan. If you are emotionally attached to your content, good luck. Um, you, like, you can be. I'm very proud of a lot of the clients I work for. Uh, most of the clients, actually, I work with. Uh, you know, I have my little pet favorites just because they align a little bit more with my personal interests. But that being said, it's, you don't take for granted that any business relationship could change. You know, businesses have their own structural needs. Things do happen, but I'm going to give everybody 110%. I'm going to understand that my 110% may not be in line with a new industry development that I have no way of knowing, or that there's other things that have happened behind the scenes that I didn't know to structure about. All I want at the end of the day is to produce the best content that I possibly can. And it would be pretty silly, not to mention pretty vain, to think that I can intrinsically do that all by myself. Not to mention the fact that if I could, I'd be severely underpaid because I'd be on my way to being like the next Bill Gates and a trillionaire, right? It's, you mm -hmm. have to build that relationship bridge. You have to lean on each other. And in that, there's going to be criticism and points of refinement that come out. You know, I think... Something I wanted to mention before, and of course it slipped my mind, is I think what makes us particularly special as a team, and that definitely helps me prep for discoveries, as, as we call them internally when we do client-facing interviews, we have a team um, of ad specialists, of social media specialists, that all have this pulse point on shared clients. So, you know, if I've had a hard time because somebody's on vacation, and so maybe I haven't been able to kind of preamble with them as much as I would going into a discovery, but I go, hey, you know, Leanne and our social, mark, uh, social department, have you heard from so-and-so and, -so and I, I think I heard that they were potentially going to do a change in the business. Did you know if that went live or not? Because that way, when I go into the meeting, I'm not wasting five to ten minutes kind of getting up to speed. It's, okay, so I hear that this has happened. This is my understanding of it. Do we want to pivot here or here or something in between that I don't know to ask about? And it, that in itself builds a lot of trust. And then mm -hmm. it also makes it a lot easier when that criticism comes because I think a lot of the times in any creative field, whether you're a writer, whether you're an ad specialist, if you're getting really, really harsh pushback from, let's say, the median reasonable client, you know, there's always going to be outliers. Um, it might be a sign that they just don't have that trust. And that's where anxiety is really poisoning that well. And you have to sometimes go, OK, what's actually going on in the room? Because we're we were really good for six months. And now all of a sudden I'm getting this weird resistance that seems kind of out of place. There's no ego in me asking. I just need to know what's going on so I can actually help you. And then you find out that maybe, you know, an, an internal sales director parted ways or they're having a really rough quarter or they're launching a massive new initiative that's taking all of their time. So you're mm -hmm. getting them in between like the sixth meeting of the day and they're just fried. And having that empathy behind it makes it a lot easier to go, I'm a person, you're a person. That's our base foundation. So I'm going to treat you with respect. I know you're going to treat me with respect. So with that, Go ahead, rip my, my, rip my work to shreds. I don't care because I want to make it better. I'm a driven person. I want to win. Help me win for you and define what that looks like for you so I can do that for you. How about you, Madison? Do you have thick skin? You have to. You absolutely have to if you're going to write. Like any kind of creative field, and I think it's Allen Ginsberg who's quoted um, with it, but you have to kill your darlings. Like yes. your content is not is your darling and you have to kill it because otherwise it's going to kill you. If a client giving you feedback is going to get under your skin and wreck your entire day, it's not the industry for you. Or that's a good sign that you need to grow and develop that thicker skin because at the end of the day, you're also delivering a product to somebody that represents their business, not your own personal agenda or your own personal thoughts. It's great to have those and it's great to have your own personality injected into your writing. But at the end of the day, you're not writing for yourself. 
you know, and yeah. you have to be able to deliver for your client. And if you can't take their feedback and go, oh, yeah, actually, I was off the mark here or, hey, actually, your feedback doesn't make sense in this context because of the program needs. Yeah. Then you're going to just flounder with your own content. No, I, I was going to ask whether it, the two of you, you know, going looking back, if this was a good idea you know, to get into this line of work as, as a writer, because writers tend to be more creatives. They tend to have a little bit more of their, their heart on their sleeve. That's the average. You're not a monolith as writers, but that's been my experience is more often than not, you know, you tend to want to be the, the creative energy coming out. And um, I think we've already talked quite a bit about kind of how, you know, building that control and building some some resilience on the other side really makes it quite quite good to value, create the value and, and make it marketable, these skills as a writer. Um, so I'm going to flip it around and instead ask, you know, like, do you think it's possible to still, you know, go into this line of work and bring up through it your passions and the more creative side to it? Yeah, I would absolutely. argue that's your job. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Like your passion is what's going to drive your writing. If you aren't passionate about what you're doing again, why are you doing it? Find something that makes you passionate. And yeah, agency writing isn't the end all be all most amazing thing, but it can help inform and enhance the other um, creative tasks that you do. You know, it doesn't have to be a one size fits all thing. You don't have to like monetize your hobby. It can still just be this wonderful little hobby on the side that you know, your content writing position helps make better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like we, we all need to be diverse people. Nobody can be professional, whoever, 24 seven, you know, um, nobody can be personal, have fun 24 seven, as much as, you know, that is the dream we'll say, but find ways to intersect that no matter what angle you're taking, you're going to be successful. I write poetry. It's something that fulfills me. Do I have any ambitions of making it a long-term career? Absolutely not. Um, that would that would kill the love that I have for something that's just a very intimate, fun experience for me. Now, I love my job. I love what it, it allows me to do because it kind of checks off every box as to what makes me me. But at the end of the day, you still do know how, have to know how to turn off that switch and go, okay, I've been in the trenches writing about this for this long. Uh, you know, we're building a really amazing, amazing agency. We've done a whole bunch of things. You know, I've been onboarding, like I said, for a couple of weeks. But when I walk through my door, I'm like, I am the girl who loves climbing mountains. I love my puppy. I love cooking and baking and doing all of these fun things. I love writing on my own time. And if I keep those separate, I'm not exa exhausted on either front. And it's it's very easy to get caught up in the two and to, especially when you're, get, you're new into writing, if you do write personally, you will find that you're burnt out for a couple of months and it can freak people out because you're like, oh my God, I don't like writing for myself anymore. It's like, just give it a minute. Your brain is adjusting to a way different capacity than what you're used to. And then you'll find that as you go into your creative writing, if you're anything like myself, you have a different ambition and a different understanding of what you're doing because you've learned different skills from who knows how many industries that now are a part of who you are, which then leads into what you write and vice versa. And it's it's a really healthy ecosystem that you create for yourself that allows you to be personally and, and professionally rewarded. But you also need to know when to hit that off button on either side. I think more than most other episodes we've done, we cover quite a bit of territory here today. So, uh, you know, a little bit of applause to to all, all four of us for, for covering such a breadth of topics in such a short period of time. But um, I think we've also given those that listen to this podcast to, you know, if you're a business leader, you may be working with writers and kind of getting an insight into how that that mindset works and how to get the most out of um, working together and from bringing those skills and those abilities to, to the surface, as well as those that might be getting into this line of work themselves or might have writing as part of their uh, larger marketing requirements in this uh, this world that is the marketing engine that we're trying to build together. So I want to thank both Megan and Madison for joining us today. And uh, I think it's been a lot of fun getting to see this uh, rarely spoken of corner of the marketing world. Hey, you brought us out of our cave, so thank you. It's been the fun. writer's cave. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> out, out from the words, and now I have to speak them? Ugh. Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, yeah. thanks, you guys, well. for thanks for being on the show today. We, uh, we definitely appreciate both of you guys. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. 
Well, that was quite the ride. I know we uh, had the opportunity to talk to two d- very different, but uh, you know, aligned in a lot of other ways, content writers who've gone through the agency world, have done the uh, the unicorn life as well, as, mm-hmm. as we call it in the marketing world, where they're wearing a lot of hats and doing a lot of things other than just content writing and maybe the reprieve that comes from a little bit of specialization in that. How about those and, hot takes uh, though? Yeah, a little a little bit of salt poured out there on uh, some, yeah. some some AI, you know, opinions out there and maybe some strong opinions about uh, what it means to be a good writer or not. But uh, if you're going into that line of work, you're definitely going to have some critics out there, maybe some of our own. But I think it's it's an interesting corner, like I said earlier at the beginning of the episode, that doesn't get a lot of sunlight. So mm-hmm. I'm glad that we were able to get both of their opinion out there and uh, see this little spoken of world of the content writer and uh, the shifts that are going on in that that world. I was excited so like coming thank- into this. Oh. Uh, before we're gonna thank them, like I, I have to say, before com- we ca- we came into speaking to them, I was super excited to hear just their own takes on topics that might seem like they'd have the same exact answers, but and they clearly didn't. So I was I was pumped about that. You know, narrative versus technical. Let's go at it. Yeah, it definitely overlapped at points, but in other areas diverged and definitely coming from two different perspectives and different backgrounds. So mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, way to go through that. So yeah, I want to say thank you again to, to uh, both Megan Bamford and Madison Sterling for joining us today on the Challenge to Unity podcast. And uh, we hope this was useful for you, whether you're leading a business or being a marketing specialist of your own and maybe stumbling into content writers or writing yourself. Yeah, and in, in addition to thanking both our guests today, you know, we want to say thank you to you for listening, wherever you may be listening. Um, maybe you're watching, maybe you are on YouTube. If you're not, um, go check out YouTube. You get to see our glimmering faces. Um, but maybe you also don't know. We're also kicking around on anywhere you get your social media, or pardon me, anywhere you get your your uh, your podcast. And we're on social media. So don't forget to subscribe. Uh, we have a new episode coming out every couple weeks on Wednesdays. Um, we do our darndest to make sure that we are speaking to business leaders and marketing professionals and providing you guys all the inside knowledge that we possibly can. Um, do the likes, do the shares, tell your friends. Um, package up the Challenge Tunity podcast. We're in August. It might be a nice gift for Christmas. You know, you can get ahead of the curve. Um, I think your mom might like it. So that being said, we appreciate you and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Cheers.